So this new talk is the talk of Patrick Malbauer. Uh, he will explain how to split a monolith, monolith application uh, with the repository and the rest. Okay, so good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, hi, welcome to my talk. I'm Patrick, I'm working as a software developer at Blue Yonder. And if you came here because you only read the title without the abstract, and like I do sometimes, and are now expecting I will show you how to split a monolithic application into a microservice architecture, then I have to disappoint you. That's not what I'm talking about. Oh. I want to talk about what we did with our application, which was which consists of various Python packages, and we had all Python packages in one repository. And at one point, we decided, yeah, we want to have one repository for every package we developed. And yeah, so let's start with this easy example how a Python package usually looks like. You have uh, for example, uh, this structure, you have the actual package, my super library with this Dunder init module in it. Maybe you have a requirements file, you probably have a setup.py file, and of course you will have tests. Um, and for us, it looked like something like this. So we had lots of these packages in one repository. Um, what we also had was this one requirements file for the whole application. Um, this was probably the worst design decision at the beginning. So even for the unit tests of every of these libraries, um, we just installed everything and used that in our virtual env to run the tests. Um, on we had actually a lot more than four of these packages in it. Um, yes, so why do we even want to split it? So there were various reasons. One of the reasons was um, other teams of our company started using some of the libraries in their own projects and they always complained about Okay, we want to contribute, but I, every time I have to l look into this big repository, it's such a pain to get it uh, just running, whatever. Um, so yeah, this was one reason. Um, another reason was, okay, I called it spaghetti code here. It's this, uh, what I mean here is cross dependencies, so you, for example, in library one, you import from library two, even if you don't actually want it at the end, because it's uh, not well structured then. Um, and yeah, so as other teams started to use our libraries, we also had to release them. Um, it, that's also easier if they have their own Git repository. And we also wanted to use uh, something like set, setup tools SCM to get automatic versioning. So if you don't know what setup tools SCM is, it's, it creates versions for your Python package out of uh, your Git versions or Mercurial versions. So usually uh, I set a pi file, looks something like this, and you have this version keyword argument where you have to manually adapt the version string every time you want to do a new release. And setup tools does this for you automatically. So here you would just say, yeah, my setup requires to set up tools SCM to be available, and I want to use this SCM version. That's then here. And what such a version then looks like is something like that. So here we have um, we are one commit after the latest tag. So I before I set a tag 0.0.1, .0 .1, 
and this def1 then says, okay, you are one commit after the latest one, and at the end you have after plus ng the start of the uh, current git commit hash. Okay, so talking about git commit hashes, um, so we decide, now decided we want to split our monolithic git repository, um, but how do we do it? If we just move certain sub packages uh, somewhere else and then initialize the repository from the start, we would lose all the history we already have. But there's, if you use Git, I don't know if there's something similar in Mercurial or any other SCM. Uh, but with, with Git, you have subtree, and subtree has another subcommand, split. And split creates um, a new history of commits for a specified prefix. So here I uh, have as prefix library three. And if you also specify a branch name, it will create a new branch which exactly has this newly generated history. What you can then do is create your uh, new package and initialize it with Git, and then you can pull this branch you created before from the monolithic repository. Now you have a new repository for your libra new uh, library three, and with all the history which uh, affected uh, library three. So, okay, this has to be done for all packages in our monolithic Git repository. What then changed for us is how do we do our continuous integration workflow? because before we had just this one repository, it didn't matter in which uh, package we made changes for our next feature. As we used Jenkins, Jenkins just checked out the latest commit. Every change in every of our packages were available, and yeah, that was easy. That's one of the advantages if you have monolithic applications, architectures, whatever. What we then did, we saw, okay, we, now we have lots of Git repositories. Let's just check out every Git repository at the beginning and create our application artifact out of this. Um, this ended up in a really messy Jenkins job. So if you don't know Jenkins, Jenkins has lots of plugins. One of those plugins is the multiple SCM plugin. There you can specify uh, yeah, multiple uh, repositories which should be checked out at the beginning of a job. And yeah, we did this for all of our extracted libraries and had this huge list and uh, this, this was horrible. It was really horrible when we had to do bug fix releases. I mean, can you imagine how uh, yeah, hard it is if you have to configure all this. Uh, mm. Okay, so in Jenkins you have to uh, specify which tag branch or whatever has to be checked out. So if we want to, wanted to do a bug fix release, we had to specify the tags or commit hashes which were used back for our release so that we only um, change the repository where we had to do the bug fix release. And I think you can imagine that this this was really horrible, so don't do that ever. Um, what you actually want to do, of course, is just use your libraries in your application just like any other library. And the problem with that was if you add your libraries to your application's requirements, txt, all, every time you change something, you would have to uh, raise the version in your requirements file because you pin your requirements, of course, 
and yeah that's also not a good workflow because it happened quite often that um, we uh, implemented new features in our library packages then the unit tests for this library passed then we thought okay we can do a release but when we actually used the new version in our application we saw oh no that's not working at all and you want to have this feedback a lot faster so what can we do here um, we came up with this workflow so we run unit tests of our libraries if they pass we let Jenkins upload the re uh, a reel to our internal DevP server and at the beginning of our application uh, job we just install those with the minus minus pre option of pip install. With this option you can install pre-releases, um, so beta releases, alpha releases, or those dev releases you saw earlier created by Setup Tools SCM. So we always had the newest uh, versions in our continuous integration pipeline um, of all libraries very new the unit at least the unit test pass um, yeah and then we created another job for actually doing application releases so if we want to do a release of our application we had to we, we now have to do releases of all the libraries where we know okay with this version it works and can then run this extra release job where this minus minus pre option is not used. Um, okay, I mentioned DevP. Um, who of you knows DevP or uses DevP? Okay, not many hands. Um, so, DevP server is um, a PyPI server. We use it in, at Blue Yonder for our internal packages, um, you, but you can also use it on your laptops. So it's also um, just a mirror for PyPI. And for example, if you are on the train and want to hack but don't have internet connection and have to install an, a package, you could do it offline if it's already cached. Yeah, you can whitelist, blacklist certain packages and do a lots of m more things. Um, another thing is um, pin, uh, yeah, requirements pinning. Um, who of you ever had this version conflict exception? Okay, my colleagues and a few others. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we agreed on, we said we don't pin the requirements in the setup pi file. So you have there this install requires. Um, because if, for example, library A requires requests greater 1.0 and smaller than 2.0, and another library wants to use the next feature of uh, which came with uh, request 2.0, for example, then you get this uh, annoying version conflict error. And most often it does not make sense even uh, giving a, a saying, okay, I want to have smaller than 2.0. And yeah, the application is then responsible to use the correct requirements, and this will avoid lots of these exceptions. Um, one other comment, so we, we don't pin the requirements in the setup pi file, but we pin them to have uh, a special set of requirements for running the tests, So, and another developer can then check out tech um, 5.0, for example, and see with which requirements the test actually passed 
back then. Okay, so now we have all those repositories. What did we actually gain? So we can use Setup Tools SCM for every repository. Don't um, we have happy library contributors? Uh, but on the other hand, for us application develop, uh, developers, it got a lot more complex. So now you, if you uh, develop a new feature, sometimes you have to uh, do changes in three, four, five repositories. You have to keep them updated all the time and that can be really annoying sometimes. But the quality and the structure of our code um, really improved. So now we have defined the requirements which every library needs, just this minimal set. So it does not happen that easy that we have this ugly cross imports which you don't actually want and so on. And that's actually a point. Um, now that you have a cleaner structure, it might be easier to see, okay, which components um, change in the same sp with the same speed or something like that and where might be an extra service uh, yeah where might it be good to introduce a new service with only that library packages so maybe that so I think what we did up till now is a step before actually getting to microservices. So, yeah. Um, and I think that's all for now. If you have any questions. Okay, so thank you for your talk. Have you some question for an old friend? So thank you for your talk, it was a nice experience. We, we have uh, pretty the same problems in our project and uh, so you, you mentioned that you're, during the deployment your Jenkins job, uh, your, your Jenkins deployment is a simple pip install and it always installs the latest versions, right? So I mean it is the latest development versions for CI and the latest stable versions mm -hmm. for, for the production release. What if you deployed some broken package to the production and you need to roll back to the previous version? How do you deal with that? Since I, I, I don't think you pin versions during the, your deployment. So how do you do roll back to the previous version? Um. No, no, um, that does not happen. So we don't pin what the libraries want, but um, we pin in our application and we also ins then install with minus minus no depths so that we don't get any recursive re requirements. I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. So do you pin versions of your library somewhere during the production or deployment? Yes, of course. So um, okay, like I said, we for in the libraries, we don't pin in the install requires section in setup pi, but we pin our, we have an extra requirements file where we pin the versions and we use these versions to run the tests for the library. And in our application, we then pin, we want library is like is like 5.0. And so it cannot happen that something else comes in. Okay, we can talk later okay. maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have uh, uh, dependencies between uh, libraries, so library A imports uh, library B uh, and uh, each other. Uh, so how did you resolve it? That depends on how... Um, it, it depends. Sometimes um, code duplication is better than having this cross dependencies. Um, yeah, that's basically it. I, it depends on how this cross reference looks like. So I don't have a special example right now, sorry. Hey, how, how about uh, depending one library uh, on the other? So, so for, for the library A, you, you require a library B. Okay. Yeah, like sometimes that. it's not a problem at all, but we noticed that for some, in some cases, we um, had libraries which depended on another library, and this one, again, required a lot of others, and we had... A, uh, again, this big unstructured thing. So, um, yeah, I don't Thanks. have the. Yeah. Hi. Uh, did you consider using uh, Git submodules for your problem? Like. For um, uh, pinpointing versions and then being able to have different kind of yeah, yeah, release branches for that. We said from the beginning we don't want to use Git submodules. It's, you uh, tried? No, we didn't. We uh, just said, nah, that's too dangerous to get uh, fucked up. <laughs> okay. Because yeah. we are doing that. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> that's the way how we uh, can pinpoint different versions and. Mm -hmm. Do like even um, yeah hotfix branches on a um, super repository. Okay. So maybe we can talk. If it works out for you, great. Yeah. Another ah, yeah. <laughs> so. Hi. Uh, you mentioned something about the code quality. Like by following this refactored code structure, you had some improvement in the code quality. I'm just curious. Like, how did you measure that? Do you measure some kind of cyclomatic complexity or something else? Like, what were your metrics to, to say that your code quality was improved? Okay, I have to admit that's just a feeling I had. Okay. Um, no, um, that came... Um, so, okay, it's difficult to explain. Uh, maybe we can talk after that. Sure. It's, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Another one? No? Okay. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your talk.